Well, good morning and welcome to church. We're still having Keno Chapel home style and we're glad to have you join us this morning. Hey, I don't know what your week has been like behind you, uh, but I'm going to guess there's been a little bit of extra frustration, a little bit of extra tension maybe, maybe some fear, but I want to encourage you that it is a new week, a new day, and we're going to get our hearts set back where they should be. We're going to be reminded this morning that our God is not taken by surprise by any circumstances of the day, and he is fully in control, and he is more than able to give us exactly what we need for this day. So let's turn our eyes back to him and refocus our hearts, and let's start our week out by singing his praises together. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with If my God is with me, whom then shall I fear? Whom then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord. You never let As I sing through the lyrics of that song and and the song that we're about to sing, I am so uh, reminded of God's goodness. And I wanted to just share with you really quickly 
um, I'm sitting today at the piano that I first learned to play piano on and I was very young and I started to love music just about when I could walk and um, at the same time I also learned to love Jesus and so those two together have um, given me something to look back on and see God's faithfulness and um, this room that this piano sits in has seen some really hard, dark times. It has seen some things that seemed quite impossible to even face. And uh, through time and through trusting in God, this room has also witnessed God working through those hard times to grow us in him and to show us of his goodness and how trustworthy he is and how he takes the most seemingly impossible situations and he turns them around and he uses them in incredible ways to show us his goodness and his strength and his mercies. So I am singing in this room that I've been singing in from very, very young. And this particular next song, uh, the words are just perfect for what we're facing ahead of us. And, and it reminds us that our story is a long one. We can look back and see the times that God has been faithful so that we can be reminded to look forward knowing that he has the victory. And our assurance is in the name of Jesus. And all the hope in the world is right there in the name of Jesus. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of Jesus. Thank you that you are there for us, even when we don't realize it, and that you have everything under control. And Lord, we need to be reminded that we're not in control, because that's what reveals back to us that you are in control. Know how we need that, Lord. Lord, I find my rest and without you I fall apart you're the one that guides my heart Lord I need
Welcome. Uh, let's grab our Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Before we get into a study of God's Word, I just want to take a moment for a little chapel family talk. There is a thing that's been talked about now called the third quarter fatigue. Third quarter fatigue is when the game is kind of in that lull. We're not even near the two-minute warning when action really ramps up, or even the fourth quarter. And that's kind of where we're at with this COVID-19 and this process we are walking through. There's some fatigue. And I know there's some temptation to vent our frustrations against the state or national government. I know many of us in this community are suffering on our jobs or without our jobs, and there's a lot of uncertainty. I know there's frustrations about wanting to get back to church where we're person to person live. Uh, I will be so happy for that day where I can look you in the eyes when I preach the word of God and uh, I can see your response and, and really know that we are together as a family. But there's, there's a temptation uh, to be frustrated. I have been, to be honest with you, I've had frustrations. I think it's especially tempting to be frustrated when some of the edicts from the state are confusing and even contradictory. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, some really wise words that I think are so applicable for us today. He wrote, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. For this is the will of God. Everybody wants to know what the will of God is. This is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance 
of foolish people. This is a time to do the will of God, to do good. And what is the context of doing good? It's to be subject for the Lord's sake, for Jesus' sake, to the emperor, governor. You see, this is a test of our commitment to submission because Christianity is not a lawless faith. Never has been. It's not the will of God. Now, there are times when the church and Christians are called to reject government laws, to obey God's laws. But brother and sister in Christ, this is not that time. So let's ask God to give us unity. Everyone has an opinion. I understand that. Opinion should not be silenced to one another. But a spirit of unity, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, we're together. And then grace for one another as we have fellowship with each other online or over the phone, together our focus on Jesus Christ. He is the ground on which we have unity. So there you have it. That's, that's our little uh, pep talk for the day. Let's pass the test by living peaceable and quiet lives so that all men might have the opportunity to be drawn to that witness to know Christ. Well, Father God, open your word to us as we begin this new series now. Thank you for your word. It answers all the questions of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Today we begin a new series that will take four to five weeks. It's simply called Afterlife. Afterlife. I've chosen this series because I want to speak to those who are fearful of death, maybe with faith in Christ, but uncertain about what will happen at our last breath. In fact, I read an interesting column by Michael Long entitled Coronavirus and the Fear of Death. This is not a Christian uh, article, but he wrote, COVID-19 has refocused the world's attention, however briefly, on the transient nature of life. The threat of death hangs in the air, and many people fear the worst. Fear comes from two places, what we know and what we do not know. Most coronavirus fears at this point belong to the latter camp. It's what we don't know. That's what people are afraid of. What happens if I die? What will be beyond the grave? What will the afterlife look like? So the fear of death can certainly dominate human thinking. In Hebrews 2, verse 15, Jesus came, it says that Jesus came to free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Jesus frees us from the fear of death. So I have two purposes for this series. I want to encourage believers, if you know Christ, I want to encourage you to live without the fear of death. And if you don't know Christ yet, my second purpose is that you would come to know Christ so that you can be freed from the fear of death. By the way, most people, even most Christians, would say, when I die, I'll go to heaven. And that to them is the end of the story. I'm looking forward to dying and going to heaven. What I want to share with you is that is a kind of a, in my, how I view it, the one summit view. I get to go to heaven. But I, in these next four to five weeks, I want to talk about four summits of the afterlife. You know, if you read or hike the Rocky Mountains, you'll learn that there are many summits. In fact, when Lewis and Clark came over to explore the West, uh, they thought you'd climb the mountains and then back down the other side and coast on into the coast. But uh, we know now that there are 100 summits, high summits of the Rocky Mountains uh, going uh, north to south. So there are four 
main summits of the afterlife. And if we don't understand these four, we're going to have a very limited view. If we have a one summit view, I just get to go to heaven, then it's going to be quite limited. And I want to help us to be really excited about what awaits us. So this is my own understanding of scripture and my interpretation of the afterlife. Uh, according to God's word, I see these four summits, and let me just list them to you. Number one is the immediate separation summit. That's the scripture, to be absent from the body is to be home of the Lord, is our last breath. The second is the completion of the body summit. This is the resurrection, when uh, our bodies will be raised from imperishable, or perishable to imperishable. The third is the Intermediate Kingdom Summit. That's what many call the Millennial Kingdom. We'll talk about that. The fourth and most important summit is the completion of the kingdom. So intermediate separation, completion of the body. Intermediate Kingdom and completion of the kingdom. Today and next week, I want us to focus on the intermediate separation or what some theologians call the intermediate state, right after we breathe our last, between that time and the completion of our bodies, the resurrection of our bodies. I want to use the story of Jesus of a man named Lazarus and a rich man. Now, before we look into this, I just want to say that this is a parable However, some theologians say, some Bible scholars, they say that the fact that Jesus actually names the poor man as Lazarus says there's maybe something more to this parable or this story that there actually could be this Lazarus who has died. This is not the same Lazarus that Jesus uh, later raised from the dead, but uh, there's some good principles in this, and I think there's more to this than just a parable. I don't think Jesus would tell a story about the afterlife that uh, would deceive people because that's just not who he is. He's perfect and he doesn't lie like human, uh, fully humans. He's fully God and of course fully human, but in the nature of God, he does not tell untruths. So uh, this is a story, so keep that in mind, but there are some interesting principles about the afterlife that I want to share with you again this week and next week. So let's think about these two men and their two contrasting destinies and how it relates to us. Let's get started in verse 19 through 22. And in these 22, verses 19 through 22, uh, Jesus here explains the contrast before death, before, between Lazarus and this rich man. So there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously each day. Rich man. Well, we know the poor man's name. We're going to be introduced to him later, Lazarus. The rich man has no name. However, later on, Bible students began to call the rich man dives. So you may have heard something like, this is the story of Lazarus and dives. Well, why did they call the rich man dives? Because in Latin, the word dives means rich. And so they named him dives. So the rich man who is clothed in purple, that's his outer garment, very expensive. What Jesus is trying to explain is this is a man of extreme wealth. Uh, the purple came from uh, a certain kind of seashell. that It was just extremely expensive, hard to get. And then his inner clothing was fine linen. He feasted every day just as much as he wanted, sumptuously, the English Standard Version says. Uh, most people in the first century had great meals just a few times a year. Uh, it wasn't a wealthy life for many people uh, living uh, throughout the empire at that time. So we've learned a little bit about dives, the rich man, extreme wealth. Now verse 20, and at his gate, 
Dives' gate, the rich man's gate, was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores. So he, he, it says that he was laid there. It, it, there the, the wording is a sense that he is paralyzed. He's unable to walk. A disabled man, not only that, but he's covered with sores. Verse 21, he desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. He was willing to even, even eat some of the crumbs from Dives' table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, I want you to know the dogs that licked his sores, these are not cute puppies that came along to keep him company, to lick him. These are the dogs that were the scavengers of that time. They ran the city streets. They were viewed as huge, filthy rats. That's kind of the view, if you could picture them. And I think what Jesus is saying here, they're licking his sores, and he doesn't even have the energy to push them away. So you're seeing the dives, the where, what kind of life he has. And then Lazarus. Notice in verse 22, the poor man, that's Lazarus, died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. Carried by the angels, a Jewish a way of saying, a great celebration. He had come to know Christ. The rich man also died and was buried. A very abrupt ending at his death. One man, great celebration for Lazarus. His life really gets fully going after he leaves here. His spirit leaves the body in this intermediate separation. And the rich man dies, and we're going to read later, he goes into torment. See, from the contrast then between life before and after death with these two men, we learn that our life situation today here on earth is not the gauge for our afterlife situation. Now, you may be going through many struggles right now, and maybe your life has been a struggle. You, you've had difficulties. Maybe it's physical health or finances or loneliness. You, you've gone through a divorce and you have felt rejection. I want you to know, if you know Christ, that is no gauge of what life will be like when your spirit leaves your body. Even in that intermediate separation before the resurrection, life, as we'll see here, as we see for Lazarus, it, it made a great turn, and you have that to look forward to. You see, there, there's challenges to this view among Christians that uh, I may have a life that was miserable here, but that is not a gauge of the afterlife. There's challenges that we need to we need to be aware of these false teachings. For instance, today there is Christian celebrityism that there are Christians here, and then there are those, those highly gifted, well-known celebrities. And, and, and there's a sense that in the afterlife, some would say, well, there'll be celebrities in the afterlife. In fact, you read about the rich man telling Abraham, hey, can Lazarus be my servant? He still doesn't get it. Uh, he's still bought, trying to boss people around, uh, and, and poor Lazarus. You know, for me, this is such an encouragement that what you may have heard at one time or another, that the ground at the foot of the cross is always level. I think I've shared with you, when I was in my early 30s, late, even late 20s, I think, I, I, I really convinced myself I was the next Chuck Swindoll, that I was going to be world-renowned, and how arrogant I was. And really sobering to realize when you come to that place in your life, for me to say, no Chuck Swindoll for me. I'm just this guy. I'm just a regular guy. And it's encouraging to me to know that, hey, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. There's also that, and it's similar, the world changer mentality. Our millennials have been taught, you're going to change the world. And when they, they start to grow in years and find out they're living calm in everyday lives. There's disappointment and there's a view that God must not love me as much as that person who's who's so well known on social media or or have made great achievements. But in heaven, in eternity, uh, there is a levelness. Also the prosperity gospel, which is no gospel at all, that if 
the prosperity gospel says if you're rich uh, here, it's because you have great faith. It's sort of the Pharisees' view. If they, you know, if you're if you're if you're really doing well in your health and your wealth, it means you know hashtag blessed. God's really in love with you, and you're going to have a great life. And that spills over. A lot of the views are going to be you know have a bigger mansion in a bigger hilltop uh, in in eternity. These are all false views. You may feel like Lazarus today, but if you know Christ, this is not going to last for you. It's not going to last. One day, you'll be carried by the angels in great celebration to Father God. Now, verse 22 shows the contrast at death. We have the contrast before death and the contrast at death. Again, uh, as I talked about, at death, um, Lazarus is carried by the angels to Abraham's side, and the rich man dies buried, and he goes to a place of torment. So not only did they have different lives on earth, rich man, Lazarus, but afterlife, now it's Lazarus, rich man or dives, the, the role has completely changed because dives did not have faith in Christ. The rich man, he, he, he had, his, his God was his wealth, clearly. See, what matters most at death is not what's behind us here on earth, but what's ahead of us. Because this, this time on earth is just in this present state, we're going to talk later about the new heavens and the new earth, but this fallen earth, it, it is uh, but a blip in time in regards to eternity. See, for non-believers, this life here on earth is the best they'll ever have. The best is here, and when a non-believer dies, it's all, all, anything good is behind them, and there's nothing good ahead. You know, I've never been to a high school class reunion. Maybe you have. Never attended one. But I've read about them. And you always have that group of people that it's maybe the cheerleaders and the, the quarterback and, and the stars on the football field or the basketball stars. And they kind of gather still in their little clique. And, and they, uh, you know, they're reminiscing. And, and they'll often say, oh, high school, it was the best years of my life. That's what you will hear them say. And I've always thought that was sad. For me, high school, I never want to go back to high school. Life got much better. Uh, maybe you have fond memories of high school, but I hope that those three or four years are not uh, the, uh, the best years of your life. I hope they're right now for you. But you have that people looking back to the glories of the gridiron or the glories of high school. Their best is gone in that little four-year blip of time. Catherine Hepburn, uh, she has passed away, but uh, she was sort of a cultural icon, actress. She and I think the African Queen and some other, other movies. In 1990, she had an interview, and she was quite elderly at that time. And in that interview, uh, she told the Associated Press this. She said, I am gradually disintegrating. I don't fear the next world. Or I don't fear anything. I don't fear hell, and I don't look forward to heaven. She said, I'm just disintegrating into nothingness. And that too is sad, to just say, this is it. The best is in the rearview mirror. Believer, I want you to take heart. I want you to take heart, because you are not gradually disintegrating. You are being renewed day by day in your spirit, and eternity awaits you. And it's going to be far more than we could ever imagine. Finally, let's study the contrast after death between these two men. Again, going back to verse 22, and we'll also look at verse 23. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted his eyes and saw Abraham far off. At, with Lazarus at his side. Twice it's mentioned that uh, the 
the poor man Lazarus was at Abraham's side. It's not meaning here that he was sitting next to him, but leaning on his chest. And that was for uh, the favored son or the oldest son. It was a place of great honor. You may remember at the Last Supper that John, the Apostle John, leaned against Jesus' chest. There, there's that sense of honor there. So Lazarus, after death, it, he is being honored for his faith in Christ. And there's this chasm, and we'll talk about this more next week, but the rich man is looking across and he's seeing Lazarus sitting leaning back into the arms and the chest of Father Abraham, the founder, if you will, of the Hebrew nation, of the Jewish people. Here's our lesson. For the believer, the best is yet to come. It's over the horizon. Don't buy into the secular view that heaven is this place of boredom and purposelessness, that uh, you just sort of float through eternity. This is the view of Michael Shermer. He wrote a book called Heavens on Earth. He said, if there are no obstacles to overcome and nothing to work for in heaven, what is there to do? Forever is a long time to be blissfully bored. If the Christian version of heaven is correct, and you get to spend eternity with an omniscient and omnipotent deity who knows and controls everything you think, do, and say, then that would make heaven like a celestial North Korea from which you would never be able to escape. It could not be further. What I just read could not be further from the truth. Eternity is a place of absolutely not one millisecond of boredom. It's a place of full purpose. We're going to have work to do, ruling with Christ and, and, and ways of fulfillment in loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, Joyce and I, I think I've shared with you that we tried camping once. And uh, I know some of you like camping. I, I'm sorry, I don't get it. In fact, we've now decided that Motel 6 is, is below our standard. We, we won't even do that now. But those of you who go camping, I, I just don't get it. I don't understand why you would willingly want to live like a homeless person. And, and oh, the bugs, you know, your, your food you cook over the fire, got ashes in it. And, uh, I don't know. I like my sleep number bed. I don't want to sleep on rocks and pine cones, so I don't get it. I, I, I really believe that camping has one purpose. It's to make us to long to be back home. Well, we're living in a fallen world. It's rough out here, isn't it? It's rough in the present state of the universe. And all of the sin, and all of the suffering, and all the uncertainty, and all the hatred, and all the racism, and all the violence, and, and the tension between governments, I, I just long for eternity. I long for that time. I hope you do too as well. In the meantime, this is not a time to just say, I'm just going to kind of check out and, and just kind of wait for that day. Hey, we have purpose here. While we're waiting for the departure to be at home with the Lord, let's be loving God. Let's be loving God today. Let's be loving people, the two greatest commandments. Let's be sharing the good news because we want as many people to be with God for eternity. And let's confidently, every single day, look forward to the afterlife. So basically, it's the words of Paul. To live as Christ and to die as gain. Father God, 
for the believer, it's everything is bright. Lord, we have a purpose here, and we will have a purpose for all eternity. Lord, even in that intermediate time as we will await the completion of our bodies, the re, that they will reconnect in their glorified state with our spirits, Lord, that intermediate separation, Lord, we, we will be with you, and that is enough. And we will be joyfully anticipating the next summits of the afterlife until that greatest and highest summit, the new heaven and the new earth, the eternal state, where you will come down and dwell in us and through us and with us. Father, what a glorious day and eternity that will be. In the meantime, Lord, we want to be faithful. We want to love you, love people, share the good news with others. And God, if there are anyone, if there's anyone listening to this video who is uncertain about what will happen when they breathe their last here, Lord, I pray that you would give them that great confidence that comes only through faith in Christ as, as we call out to you, Father God, save me. Save me from the penalty of my sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I give you my life and I will serve you in response, in grateful response to Jesus dying in my place. So Father God, all glory and majesty go to your name and in the name of your Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Hello, I'm Pastor Matt, and I'm the Youth Ministries Pastor here at Commando Chapel. I'm so thankful you were able to join us for worship this morning. We sure miss you guys. So from our home to yours, we're hope, hoping that you're staying healthy and happy and safe. I've got a couple of announcements for you this morning. If you're interested in being a youth and children's intern, we have an incredible internship for young adults seeking to build their foundation in church ministries. The application process starts right now and goes until June 7th. You can go to our website to check out all the details and to download the paperwork. Please prayerfully consider the incredible opportunity for the 2020-2020 school year because we'd love to have you. We also have another great ministry called Stories of Hope. Check out the Stories of Hope page located under our Ministries tab on commandochapel.org website. Our goal is to fill this page with beautiful stories of how God has impacted people's lives. If you're inter interested in sharing your story, simply go to the website commandochapel.org, click the ministry tab button, and on that page you'll see a button called tell your story. Click that and begin to let us know about the journey God has taken you on. Well, there's a brand new story up right now, a beautiful story about Tyler and Marissa Kenworthy and the journey God has brought them through. We'd love for you to go check out that page. If you want more information about this ministry, you can contact Cassie Merritt at storiesofhope at commandochapel.org. Parents of incoming 6th through 8th grade students or those who are interested in joining my junior high team, join us for our parent volunteer meeting on Zoom this coming Wednesday, May 20th from 6.30 to 7.30. If you don't have Zoom, simply download the app and go to our website and all the instructions are there on how to join that meeting. We'd love for you to join so we can tell you all about how God is going to do incredible things and, and new things and exciting things this next year. So please join us for that meeting. Also, there are plans underway for a future mission trip to Tonga to serve alongside our missionaries, Osi and Jennifer Halalilo. October 8th through the 22nd, this is going to be led by Pastor Mitch and Mike McGrath. If you're interested join, in joining the online planning meeting on May 24th, go to our website and you can see all the details and links to go to that meeting. Also, tonight is our Sunday night prayer session with the pastors on Zoom. It starts at 6 p.m. Boy, if there's ever a time that we need to be on our knees praying, now's the time. So we'd love for you to join us. We hope to see you there. Well, I'm going to send you out with these words of Paul. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Amen. I hope you guys have a great week and can't wait to see you again soon. God bless you. Amen.